Thank you very much. It's always a, a great honor to be invited to speak by a group in another country. And um, unfortunately, I kind of messed this up. Um, I, when I, I left Washington, I, I flew out Icelandic and uh, flew into Reykjavik, um, I don't know, whatever it was, a day and a half ago. And uh, uh, just barely made the plane back on to uh, Belund. Belund? Belund. <laughs> and uh, just barely made the plane. And as I, was, I, as I was sitting down and I was taking my laptop out of my briefcase and I had it like this and I hear somebody yelling behind me, Bill, Bill! And I go, no, nobody knows me here. And I look around and uh, um, it's Brigitte. <laughs> we are on the same plane from Iceland. And so um, uh, I said, well, why don't you there's nobody sitting here, why don't you come sit with me? And she goes, oh no, they won't, they won't let you do it. And I said, just let me talk to him. I went and talked to the, talked to the stewardess and uh, she said, well, I don't have any food for her. And I said, she can eat mine. So she said, okay. So I go and get Brigitte and I'm still carrying my laptop. And you know, she comes and you know, I, I sit here next to the window and she sits next to me and I take my laptop and I, I stuff it down between the center thing and the seat. It's a MacBook Air, it's only about that thick. It, it, it's stuck in there really nicely. And that's where it stayed when I got off the plane. <laughs> and I spent days preparing this PowerPoint. And so we have worked on this problem for at least the last 24 hours. <laughs> and it's finally solved, I hope. So, and by, by the way, I just, as long as we're talking about Brigida, I, I, I don't know how many of you saw her message yesterday, but it was just excellent. I, I, I wanted to make a comment, but I knew she'd be embarrassed. But, uh, you know, this is Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winning type of stuff that she's involved in. And I think the, uh, the Peace Prize is actually, actually uh, given by the Swedish Academy, not the Norwegian Academy, and I think there are some Swedes here, so. Okay, um, so the title of my presentation is Beyond Left and Right, Dropping Ideology and Doing What Works, which is not as advertised, but I have to do whatever the Spirit leads me to do. So let me tell you what, uh, what this mo movement looked like 15 years ago. There was, uh, this was the pre-9-11 truth time, uh, these conferences in the U.S. were all very patriotic events, uh, pretty much focused on upholding the values of the U.S. Constitution. And so now let's do this one. Okay, I just wanted to, wanted to give you a word about what the background of my presentation is. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, this is the um, a uh, picture I took two years ago at the Kennedy Space Center, right on the beach. It's, it's not an angle that you usually see, but there's a little road and you can sneak back. That's about as close as you can get to it. That's the Space Shuttle Discovery sitting on the pad just before its last flight. Uh, it's now residing in Washington at the Air and Space Museum. Okay. So, uh, this is kind of an outline for what I'm going to talk about so that you don't get impatient that I'm not making progress. I'm going to give you a little news, a little humor, a look back at the Money Masters. Is it still relevant? I'm going to talk about Ron Paul and gold money. I'm going to talk about the Libertarian Party presidential run. I'm going to talk about uh, the U.S. Constitution's money clauses, which are, are key to understanding why Ron Paul is wrong about the money question. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the Need Act, which was uh, a, a lot of people in monetary reform think that's the latest and greatest. It was written by Dennis Kucinich. Uh, it, it has a basic terrible flaw in it as well. I'm going to talk about tungsten in gold bars. I'm going to talk about Iceland forgiving uh, mortgage debts. I'm going to talk about the NDAA, which uh, Brigitte talked about last night. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the monetary reform solution. So, news. Um, QE3 uh, was announced uh, just last week, and in an 11 to 1 vote, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors decided to launch a new $40 billion a month program 
This program is open-ended with bond purchases, but they're buying mortgage-backed securities this time. All they're doing is buying the nastiest junk mortgage paper off of the big banks. It's a complete giveaway to the big banks. Very little is going to trickle down to the public just by before, just like before. It's not going to work. And here's already some early evidence. According to Nasdaq.com, uh, this is... Uh, um, uh, no. Uh, according to the ratings firm Egan Jones, um, the, the Fed's decision will hurt the U.S. economy and by extension credit quality, and as a result, the uh, U.S. credit rating has been slashed now to AA-. Okay, so here's the cost of, uh, of the QEs. QE1 cost uh, the federal government $1.7 trillion. QE2 cost $600 billion. That's a total of $2.3 trillion over the past three or four years to create, according to Ben Bernanke, 2 million jobs. Now, I'll tell you, in America, we don't believe 2 million jobs have been created unless you're counting jobs at McDonald's. But in any case, that's a grand total of $1.1 million per job that's been created. That's not really a good investment for, American, for the American taxpayer. And so uh, this, is, this is the benefit. Uh, um, the, the one benefit is the toy manufacturers now have a new toy for Christmas, the Ben Bernanke helicopter toy. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little uh, thing about a little story about canoe racing, that, which uh, kind of explains something about the American economy and how uh, people approach it. A Japanese company, Toyota, and an American company, General Motors, decided to have a canoe race on the Missouri River. Both teams practiced long and hard to reach their peak performance before the race. On the big day, the Japanese won by a mile. The Americans, very discouraged and depressed, decided to investigate the reason for the crushing defeat. The management team, made up of senior management, was formed to investigate and recommend appropriate action. Their conclusion was that the Japanese had actually had eight people rowing and one person steering. Well, the American team had eight people steering and one person rowing. So American management hired a consulting company and paid them a very large amount of money for a second opinion. They advised that too many people were steering the boat while not enough were rowing after they produced their report. To prevent another loss to the Japanese, the rowing team's management structure was totally reorganized to four people, no, four steering supervisors three steering superintendents, and one assistant superintendent steering manager. Now, maybe unless you're familiar with American business talk, that's, that doesn't register, but I hear somebody laughing out here. Uh, they also implemented a new performance system that would give the one person rowing the boat greater incentive to work hard. It was called the Rowing Team Quality first program. With meetings, dinners, and free pens for the rower. There was a discussion of getting new paddles, new canoes, and other equipment, extra vacation days for practices and bonuses. So anyway, they came to the next race. The next year, the Japanese won by two miles. Humiliated, the American management laid off the rower for poor performance, halted development of the new canoe, sold the paddles, canceled all capital investments for new equipment. The money saved was distributed to the senior executives as bonuses, and next year's racing team was outsourced to India. <laughs> okay. So, what's the problem? Well, I discussed this uh, in, in both my films. This is the latest one. This is just a little, uh, a couple minute summary of what the problem is. I can't say it any better than I said it here. You must understand that every 
penny, every dollar we have in circulation is created as an interest-bearing debt. So what is the national debt? When government spends more than it collects in taxes, it has to borrow the difference by selling interest-bearing IOUs, such as U.S. bonds. When a U.S. bank buys a $100 U.S. bond, it gets to loan out 10 times that amount. So the bank not only gets back the $100 plus interest from the federal government, it gets to loan out another $1,000 it doesn't have and charge additional interest. Banks are allowed to create this extra money out of thin air. That's why bank buildings are the biggest in every town on the planet. This system of lending way more than you have is called fractional reserve lending. Almost all our money is created by banks, lending it to people, to companies, or to government. As we'll see, there is a better way for a government to get money. Simply issue it without debt for the benefit of all citizens equally. Abraham Lincoln did it, Ben Franklin did it, Jefferson wanted to do it. Honest Americans have fought against this bank-controlled debt money system throughout American history. But unless we change it soon, most of our freedoms will soon be lost in a tidal wave of debt. Seventy-five years ago, an employee of the Atlanta Federal Reserve explained the importance of the debt money system and how it can strangle our economy. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation. If the banks create ample money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. When one gets a complete grasp of the picture, the tragic absurdity of our hopeless position is incredible. It is the most important subject intelligent persons can investigate and reflect upon. Our government should never go into debt. It doesn't need to go into debt. A government can issue the money it needs. That's absolutely right. Under our current money system, the government has to borrow our money into existence, then pay interest on it. That's why they call it the national debt. All our money is created out of debt. Politicians who focus on reducing the national debt without trying to actually fix the underlying cause probably don't understand what the national debt really is. To reduce the national debt would be to reduce our money, and there's already not enough money for the average person. Why haven't we heard this before? Because most of the media and Congress are beholding to the big banks for loans. Yes, Congress still appropriates money, but where do they get it? Again, what they can't raise from taxes, they borrow from banks. But on top of that, in 2008-2009, Congress bailed out the biggest banks by giving them nearly a trillion dollars. The worst part is, we aren't just giving the money away, we're borrowing it to give it away. If we don't do something about the fact that we are now in a situation where the additional debt we're taking on is actually depressing GDP, we're going to have a major problem here in the very near future. You can't keep doing that forever. Sooner or later, the people that loan us that money are going to say, no, we're not going to loan you anymore. One of the things I think that's difficult to, to figure out from the political side of this thing, it's clear that they're making a lot of mistakes. And the question I, in my mind is, are these mistakes? Could people in Washington, you know, the highest officials of the land, really be ignorant about <laughs> what they're doing? Because I can't look at what the politicians are doing in Washington. I can't look at that and say, there's any hope of that working. And these guys have to face election. Now, when the next election rolls around, they're not going to be politically popular figures. There are going to be consequences for the politicians. So what makes them push the wrong buttons? Nobody can borrow themselves out of debt. No more than, like I said before, you cannot drink yourself sober. And that's what we're all trying to do. So it don't make any difference what kind of stimulus. And Obama, he had the right idea. We're going to build lots of new roads, but he's going to borrow the money. Well, what, how, how, we can't even pay the debt now. I mean, we can't even pay the interest on it. And nobody's even talking about the debt problem as such. They're talking about the fact that, gee, the bankers aren't making enough money to uh, 
live in the way that they're accustomed to. Until politicians begin to understand where the root of the problem lies, we're never going to fix this. But the good news is that the solution isn't new or radical. America used to do it. Throughout American history, politicians have fought with big bankers over it. But this aspect of our history has now been erased from history books. I think we need to reconsider and rethink, perhaps, uh, the very foundations of our economic and monetary system. Uh, the government, a government agency of some kind, should take charge uh, of the money supply. But that's not the way it is now in Great Britain. No, not, no nor, in every, not in any country. It's, it's almost all over the world. It, it, it's, um, the bulk of the money supply is now, is now created by commercial banks. That's dead. If we were starting, uh, uh, for people that were just at the start of, a, of the constitution of a society, and someone suggested, um, well, look, the best, thing, the best way of creating the money and putting it in um, is to combine it with the function of uh, providing a competitive profit-making market uh, for, for borrowing and lending, it would be regarded as idiotic. You want a new cause to embrace? You want to do something good for humanity? How about one simple reform that will fix most of the bad things in this world, like hunger, poverty, disease, and misery? This is the ultimate civil rights struggle, humankind's escape from serfdom. Okay. And I sincerely believe that. This is, this is the most important struggle anybody could be a part of. It's a struggle for the generation of, of those of you in the audience to understand and work within your countries to fix. It is the leading cause of hunger, poverty, misery, and disease. Uh, it's, it's been estimated, a very small amount of money, a fraction of the money that was given away in QE2 even, the smallest of the QEs in America, I think uh, about 20% of that would eliminate most of the deaths in Africa that occur from disease right now. Millions of people could be saved just with a small fraction of what we give away to banks just in America. Okay, so monetary reform rests on these two great pillars. And I don't care how you get there, but you have to do these two things. There are probably numerous ways of getting there. Uh, number one is eliminate the ability of the national government to borrow money. You don't have to have a national debt. All governments should be forbidden from borrowing. Why? Because they borrow primarily from banks. And what's the old biblical uh, uh, prophecy or the, the biblical proverb? The borrower is servant to the lender. And it's absolutely true. Once you have a government borrowing from banks, you no longer have self-government of we the people. You have government by bank. Political scientists have developed a word for this. It is called plutocracy. You don't have democracy. You have a shell that looks like democracy, but in fact, it's plutocracy. And that's why all of you think, I'll bet everybody in this room right now would, would agree with this statement, that your government is no longer responsive to the people. That's why. They can't be responsive to you because they're responsive to the banks. As long as government borrows from banks, it can be no other way. Okay, uh, I've never uh, written a word. Uh, these are my two personal precepts that I've lived by my entire 35-year writing career. I've never written a word that uh, I wouldn't be proud for any of my four children to read. And then number two, I've never written anything that delivers a hopeless message. I mean, why do it? You know, unless you're some evil person trying to destroy humanity, you've got to give humanity some type. You present the problems and show them a solution or else get off the stage. And that's what I really like about Brigitte, you know. Uh, uh, here, she, she came from, you know, a far left kind of... Uh, 
uh, observation point where, you know, she would probably early on have agreed, yeah, our government's too bad, too corrupt to fix, you know, we can't fix it. But then she gradually got into it, and now she gave, how many people saw Brigitte's message last night? Well, you heard it. What, what is her message? That government is all we've got. We've got to fix it. Right now, it's not operating for our benefit. It's operating for the bank's benefit. That's the core of the whole thing. But we can't just let it go. It's all we've got. Power of, uh, uh, abhors a vacuum. If you take away government, it's a binary decision. You're either ruled by government or you're ruled by bank. You take away government, then you've got bank. No more rule of law. How many people understand what no more rule of law would mean? It would mean the rule of the jungle. How many people are prepared to go to that? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Doggone anarchists. I understand where you're coming from, but it's, I don't believe it. Okay, so what are the four great attributes of a righteous life according to the Bible? Faith, hope, charity, and love. Like it or not, most people still look at the U.S., look to the U.S. to be the last great hope of the common man to escape the perpetual chains of serfdom. The U.S. was the first colony to beat the Bank of England with their debt money system. We've been the only ones who have fought it, sometimes successfully, on and off for the past 300 years. Yes, as you will see, although our nation is only 236 years old now, we were fighting the English gold money system for nearly a century before that. Everyone in this room believes that the most important power of a sovereign is the money power. We must take back the money power into the hands of we the people or there is absolutely no hope for our economies. A nation's money should serve the public interest alone, but instead in every nation on earth, it now serves the banking interest and that is the core of all problems. People across the world are crying out to be free. Even in Iran, the vast majority of the younger people want freedom. Here's an example of a cell phone video shot from the 15th floor of a group of apartment blocks on Saturday night in Tehran, uh, just after their failed uprising. What was it, about a year and a half ago, a year ago? These are people crying out to be free. That's all they want. Makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Okay, so as I said before, monetary reform rests on these uh, two great pillars. Now there are probably several ways to approach implementing these two great pillars. Uh, of a righteously constructed sovereign state of the people, by the people, and for the people. I don't care how you get there, but you have to end up here. I have two uh, other great... Uh, oh, no, wrong. I've already done that. I went backwards. Okay, back to this. So, now we're going to take um, a look at the Money Masters. That's just a little reminder of where we are. We're moving along. Um, I think this has held up pretty well, considering, uh, but you can um, decide for yourself. It was, even though it was uh, three hours and 23 minutes long, and despite the fact that it was shot in very old, very low quality video format called Hi8, uh, it still consistently ranks in the top 25 most uh, uh, documentaries of all time. So you, let's take a look at how it held up. Remember, 
I wrote this in 1995. It was shot in, uh, in late 1995 and edited and uh, released in 1996. Maybe. What's going on in America today? Why are we over our heads in debt? Why That's can't beautiful, isn't it? bring debt under control? <laughs> Why are so many people on okay. both parents that's, that's now not, that one's not and both work. dead end jobs and still making do with less? You want to listen to the audio track What's for the two minutes or you want to go on? And way of life? Why does the government tell us inflation is low when the buying power of our paychecks is declining at an alarming rate? Only a generation ago, bread was a quarter and you could get a new car for 1995. The problem is that since 1864, we've had a debt-based banking system. All our money is based on government debt. We cannot extinguish government debt without extinguishing our money supply. That's why talk of paying off the national debt without reforming our banking system is an impossibility. That's why the solution does not lie in discussing the size of the national debt. Rather, it lies in reforming our banking system. This is the Federal Reserve Headquarters in Washington. It sits on this very impressive address, right on Constitution Avenue, right across from the Lincoln Memorial. But is it federal? Is it really part of the United States government? Well, what we're about to show you is that there's nothing federal about the Federal Reserve, and there are no reserves. The name is a deception created back before the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913 to make Americans think that America's central bank operates in the public interest. The truth is that the Federal Reserve is a private bank owned by private stockholders and run purely for their private profit. Okay, so does, does everybody understand that the Federal Reserve system, or have you heard that it's actually not part of the government, that it's actually a private bank? No Americans know anything about the Danish system. <laughs> okay, um, so um, this is a Naomi Prince, former director of Goldman Sachs, described the Money Masters in Cine East magazine as, quote, doing a superb job of revealing the truth behind the Fed and the powerful global financiers whose self-interest has dictated our banking system from the beginning. She's famous in the United States. Okay, back to this. So now we're going to move to Ron Paul and gold money. Uh, Congressman Ron Paul is one of the primary problems with us for us monetary reformers. He's the, the, he is one of the main reasons that everyone is still so confused about the money power. Now, I like Dr. Paul. For years, he's been the voice of anti-Fed forces, but where he goes wrong is the solution, the gold solution. While we agree that the problem is that the quantity of money is out of our control, we disagree on how to fix that. He thinks you can fix it by going back to the gold standard. And I'll tell you right now, he's right in one respect. That will control the quantity of money. But, this is a picture of Dr. Paul and I where I, I paid 400 bucks to go to this meeting uh, to try to uh, get him to agree to meeting me. And, and, you know, so I said, why don't we come to some sort of a consensus so that I'm not always beaten on you? And he said, oh, yeah, that's good. And he gave me his car, and he gave me the card of his legislative assistant. And I, I document all this trail of emails that followed in my book. Uh, but the bottom line is nothing ever happened that he would not submit to a meeting. Okay, so this is my axiom. It matters not what backs the money. All that matters is who controls the quantity. We were on a gold money system during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Didn't do us a bit of good. Yes, it controlled the quantity, but obviously controlling the quantity is not the issue, is it? Because it didn't, it didn't prevent the Depression from happening. What the issue is, is that the control of the quantity should be in the hands of we the people. 
because there's only one other alternative in this world. Them, the bankers. You either have to do it through we the people and our elected government, or it'll be them, the bankers. And keeping it in the hands of we the people is not easy, and Brigitte told you how difficult it is. And she, she wants to retire from Parliament in the next couple of years. And I told her, you cannot do that. You're the only one out there. But it's hard. And when you're in the battle, all you see is how hard it is. You don't see how much progress you're making. But now I'm going to play a clip of her here in a minute. And she is so loved in the United States, and she just doesn't realize it. That's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, it is. That's, that'll work. That'll work. Whew. Thought it locked up. Okay. So uh, can anyone offer any evidence that all, uh, although there were laws, that there were actual regulators in the financial sector that were effective? And that doesn't even make any sense. But anyway, the bottom line is no. Sorry. Some, some of this, it just didn't tra translate from my Mac over to a PC very well. Okay, so here, this is the thing that just makes me furious. I, I could show you at least three or four different video segments of Ron Paul saying this on Nationwide TV. It takes a second. I don't like the idea that they have monopoly control. It's a cartel. They get to print the money. And uh, the Constitution really doesn't give them that authority. The Constitution said that only gold and silver can be legal tender. Uh, it's not true. The Constitution does not say that only gold and silver can be legal tender. How can a guy of his status repeatedly get on national TV and say this? And it's not even, it's been, it's been ruled repeatedly by federal courts that that's not the case. It's been ruled by the Supreme Court on four different occasions that's not the case. Murray Rothbard, the king of the gold bugs, Professor Rothbard, has even stated in his own book that for, since the time of the last the Supreme Court ruling, this is not the case. And yet Ron Paul keeps saying it over and over and over, and everybody in America thinks it's true. So for the past 40 years or so, the gold bugs have completely dominated talk of true monetary reform and been able to successfully pigeonhole the debt-free, government-issued money solution, the greenbacker solution, my solution, or the solution I, I uh, support, as nothing but wild money printing. But I say that if the money power is put into the hands of we the people in a way that deconsolidates the money power, democratizes the money power to the maximum extent which is politically practical, why in the world would we deliberately create so much money that it would destroy the nation? The whole purpose of the study of economics is to create stability. But everything in the American economy right now is, creates volatility, ups and downs, ups and downs. But if you try to go talking about monetary reform where you want a stable money supply, these people just, the whole academic community just shuts you out. So as you'll see in the next six slides, the same argument was going on in the United States in the 1896 presidential election between William Jennings Bryan and the gold money candidate, William McKinley. So uh, the Libertarian Party, oops, did I miss something here? Yeah, last year I decided that I needed to attack the gold bug community head on to really spread this message farther and faster. So I decided to go right to the heart of the gold bug problem and run for the presidential nomination of the Libertarian Party. The Libertarian Party is America's third largest political party. 
Uh, it's the one place where the gold bug political activists are the most firmly entrenched. My mission was begin to, pl to plant some seeds of truth batter away at this gold monument that Ron Paul has uh, erected, and it turned out to be pretty effective. I didn't win the Libertarian Party's presidential nomination at their convention in May, but I did much better than I expected to. I consistently came in second in every state's straw poll where I was in the presidential debates. So who did win? This guy. Former governor of New Mexico, Gary Johnson. He was a failed Republican candidate before he suddenly dropped out of the Republican race because his campaign was over $200,000 in debt. And on December 28th last year, he announced that he'd really been a libertarian all his life and joined the Libertarian Party. But is he any improvement over the Democrats and Republicans from a monetary reform perspective? Well, that's, uh, that's his face on the far right adding himself to uh, four great American presidents on Mount Rushmore. This is part of his political campaign material, too. <laughs> so what does this new American political uh, messiah have to say on the money question? Here's a recording of a studio appearance he made on a Georgia radio station um, about 10 months ago. Uh, followed by a video of something that he said at the Florida debate, followed by my response. Unfortunately for him, with this first uh, segment from the Georgia radio station, is I came on two hours after him, and uh, the, the DJ said, boy, Gary Johnson was just on two hours ago, and he said some really strange things, <laughs> and gave me the tape. <laughs> so that's why I have it. It's one thing to borrow money, which is an okay phenomenon. It's another thing to print money. Borrowing is okay. Printing money, that's what we need to stop. We own the Federal Reserve. There's this misconception that the Federal Reserve is some private entity. But if I might, uh, if I might give an analogy here, we own all, we, U.S. taxpayers, we own all the stock in the Federal Reserve. It's not true. I'm asked, what about uh, criminal prosecution of those on Wall Street? You know what, it's probably because none of them committed any crimes, none of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes. There's the list of the crimes. Any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes, they just made some incredibly bad decisions. I don't even remember the three stooges. Okay, crashes are caused by just one thing, and that's bubbles. Bubbles are caused by just one thing, and that's by banks being in complete and total control of the quantity of the American monetary system in complete contradiction to the U.S. Constitution. Um, secondly, mortgage were, mortgages were sliced and diced, and they were sold multiple times. The same mortgage simultaneously was sold in multiple arenas. This is clear-cut fraud, clear-cut theft, and it needs to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. So there was kind of a difference there. That's my point. Okay. So I didn't do too badly. Uh, none of the other libertarian presidential candidates would speak a word about the economy when I was uh, in one of the presidential debates. They covered every other subject, but they wouldn't open their mouths on the economy because every time they did, I'd smack them because they didn't know what they were talking about. They were afraid that I'd correct all their errors on live TV. Uh, so here is um, the current top of the page. But you know, this, this is remarkable. Even though I did nothing but bash these guys in the mouth on every occasion I got, this is the current website of the, pre of the Libertarian Party. Look who's down in the bottom right-hand corner. <laughs> and now I'll play you the clip of if you actually... Cl if you actually clicked on that. 
Republicans and Democrats are both in the pocket of the financial community. The top 12 uh, 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 contributors to Obama's campaign are the top 12 banks. Five of the six top contributors to Romney's campaign are the, are the big banks. You need someone who will pound on the table day and night about this economic issue and say, stop the looting, let's start prosecuting, and return the, the money power back to we, the people of the United States. That was my, my last appearance as a Libertarian Party candidate. <laughs> okay. This computer's a little boggy. Okay, so now let's leave Ron Paul and Gary Johnson return to an era very similar to our current condition, when the forces of monetary reform were at their zenith in the United States the 1896 campaign between the gold money candidate William McKinley and the silver money candidate William Jennings Bryan. This is such a cool picture, this is why I use it. It doesn't really show a good, that good a picture of Bryan, but this is Bryan with uh, uh, four Indian chiefs. I'm just The costumes are amazing to me. But check out the guy and the little guy in the center. He's got sunglasses on. This was taken, this was taken in 1890, at the latest, 96. Mr. Cool Indian Guy. Okay, so now uh, I think what this clip is is actual uh, some of Brian's actual voice um, about uh, ten years after after the 1896 presidential race. Uh, Edison finally invented a way to m record voices. And so he uh, put the speech in front of Brian, and Brian actually read in one of the very first Edison recordings, read his famous Cross of Gold speech. And I just wanted you, it's so great to actually be able to hear his actual voice. The humblest citizen in all the land, when clad in the arm of a righteous cause, is stronger than all the hosts of error. I come to speak to you in the defense of a cause as holy as the cause of liberty, the cause of humanity. Never before in the history of this country has there been witnessed such a contest as that through which we have just passed. Never before in the history of American politics has a great issue been fought out as this issue has been by the voters of a great party. On the 4th of March, 1895, a few Democrats, most of them members of Congress, issued an address to the Democrats of the nation, asserting that the money question was the paramount issue of the hour, declaring that a majority of the Democratic Party had the right to control the action of the party on this paramount issue, and concluding with the request that the believers in the free coinage of silver in the Democratic Party organize, take charge of, and control the policy of the Democratic Party. In this contest, brother has been arrayed against brother, father against son. The warmest ties of love, acquaintance, and association have been disregarded. They tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that the great cities rest upon our broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms, and the grass will grow in the streets of every city of the country. We care not upon what line the battle is fought. If they say bimetallism is good, but that we cannot have it until other nations help us, we reply that instead of having a gold standard, because England has, we will restore bimetallism and then let England have bimetallism because the United States has. If they dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standards, the good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost. Having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, 
and the toilers everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And another reason I wanted to play that for you is just to show, you know, everything that I'm saying here is, there's not, it's nothing new. This has been in the American political context for centuries, the same debate over and over and over again. Gold is concentrated money. It's easy for the bankers to control it. They like the Federal Reserve System better, but the, their fallback position is gold, gold money. And I predict, I predict right here, what's going to happen is after this next bubble pops, you're going to see it pop internationally, and you're going to see a, an immediate pressure to bring on an international gold money system. I guarantee you that's what's going to happen. And people are going to say, oh, yes, it's the salvation. They won't look at history. Didn't work before. Not going to work again. Doesn't provide you any more freedom. But that's what's going to happen. It's going to be offered as the solution. Okay, so now we're going to look at uh, the U.S. Constitution's money clause because here I'm asserting that a very powerful congressman is deliberately misleading the American people on TV. So that needs to be backed up by proof. Uh, this is Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. This is the only section of the U.S. Constitution that actually grants power to Congress. The, the amount of the Constitution that grants power to Congress is just a teeny little amount. Congress has granted, granted specific powers, and that's it. And they've taken it way overboard now. This is what it says. The Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense. And incidentally, you probably didn't know this, but it's big news to Americans, too. Did you know that in 1900, 90% of the income for the, federal, the U.S. federal budget was funded through this way, duties, imposts, and excises. It was not funded through income tax. The income tax law didn't come in until 1913. We paid for everything with duties, imposts, and excises. I think every nation should have a protective tariff. That way it helps people in the nation become more self-sufficient. This free trade nonsense is just that. It's nonsense. There is no free trade. It only serves to export the wealth of the wealthy nations to the most ruthless slave states in the world. We have to get away from this notion of importing all our basic manufactured goods on ships. We need tariffs high enough, just high enough, to stimulate internal national production of almost all consumer items. You guys need to make your own refrigerators and TV sets. You don't need flat screen TVs from China. All you have to do is raise their price, and somebody out here is going to start making flat screen TV sets right in this town. That way you keep your money in your nation instead of this continuous drain to supporting slave states. Okay, now let's look at clause number two to borrow money on the credit of the United States. I have a problem with this, and so did Thomas Jefferson. Uh, in fact, this was the only defect he saw in the U.S. Constitution. He said, I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution. I would be willing to depend on that alone for the reduction of the administration of our government. I mean an article, an additional article, taking from the federal government the power of borrowing. Amen. Okay, so the second biggest, biggest confuser on this topic is the term coin money. And I, I, you know, I wondered if I should try to, to draw this definition for you guys, but it's important to me, and so I'm just going to do what I think is the right thing to do. So you're going to, this is the deep dive into the U.S. Constitution. It'll just take a couple minutes, and then we'll be out and we'll be into something else. 
uh, to the gold bugs or the metalists, as I call them. This means that only metallic, uh, oh, oh yeah, I should read it first. To coin money, regulate the value thereof. Now to the gold money crowd, coin means coins. I have here a US silver dollar. A coin, they think it means coins, but that's not what it meant in Revolutionary War America. In a lengthy definitive paper in 2008, Professor Robert Nadelson of Harvard University explained the meaning of this, the coinage clause, as follows. Coin, even in monetarist Britain, meant payment of any kind. The verb to coin could mean to make or forge anything. Today you hear it in the common expression, to coin a phrase, to make a phrase. So, pursuant to this usage, paper money could be coined. Uh, but the Supreme Court has ruled on the acceptability of paper money, money under the coinage clause as well. And repeatedly, there is now absolutely no scholarly, scholarly debate on whether or not the verb coin implies metal money only. The Supreme Court has ruled on this in 1870 in Hepburn versus Griswold. Here you see it. Now, uh, according to uh, Professor um, even the most ardent of the gold money academics, the late Professor Murray Rothbard, admitted defeat in his book published by the Ludwig von Mises Institute entitled A History of Money and Banking in the United States Before the 20th Century. According to Rothbard, after Juilliard versus Greenman in 1884, quote, from then on paper money would be held consonant with the U.S. Constitution, close quote. In other words, this Ron Paul statement is wrong, even according to the head gold bug in academia, Murray Rothbard. He has no excuse for saying this. Why he does, I do not know. He says a lot of other good things. If he was, if he was a presidential candidate right now, uh, I'd vote for him of the three major candidates. For sure I'd vote for him, because the other ones are just Oops. Okay, um, interesting aside, on the Ludwig von Mises Institute, how many of you all have even heard of the Ludwig von Mises Institute? Okay, not that many, but, so I'll just tell you, uh, he's big in the United States, especially amongst the, the gold money community. Uh, however, Ludwig von Mises was an Austrian economist who came to the United States and his entire career he was supported for uh, a professorship at New York University by guess who? Guess who supported him for his entire career? The Rockefeller Foundation. This is the head gold money group. So do you think that the Rockefeller Foundation just out of the goodness of their heart has de decided to put forward uh, a money system which would destroy their entire banking community. I don't think so. Okay, um, that's why I call the gold money solution the false solution. But this has not always been clear. Even President Andrew Jackson was unsure of the meaning of the coinage clause. If Congress has the right under the Constitution to issue paper money, it was given them to be used by themselves, not to be delegated to individuals or corporations. In other words, he, Jackson hated the idea that, the, that Congress had given the money power over to the first bank of the United States, the second bank of the United States. Do you know how these banks were funded, actually? They actually had stock. They were all composed of bankers. One, one banker <coughs> would lend another banker $10,000 so that of money they just made up out of nothing, incidentally, so that he could buy stock in the bank, and then that banker would lend the 10000 bat to another banker so he could buy his stock, and that's how the stock was purchased. It was completely fraudulent. On top of this, there is a, a superb, another superb nugget. Uh, this quotes from a document called Notes on the Federal Constitution, written uh, in, 18, in 1787. 
On August 16, 1787, the framers' final vote on the money powers delisted paper money, lest it, quote, excite the opposition of the money-bent, moneyed interests and be used to exploit a general paper money phobia so as to exclude it altogether. Before voting, Madison obtained firm agreement that the delisting did not disable the government from the use of public notes as far as they could be done safe and proper. So that's, that's as deep as we're going to go, because I, I know that's, uh, the, this is big in the United States, but not here. In any case, now let's look at Dr. Paul's confusion, what, what he's confused about. Article 1, Section 10 says that no state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, blah, 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 coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold or silver coin a tender in payments. This is in the section that prohibits states from doing stuff. This is not in the section that talks about the role of the federal government. All the, uh, initially in the United States, the only banks that, that were, were chartered by the individual states. There was no federal reserve. There was no federal chartering. All banks, just the state legislature would say, okay, you can be a bank, you can be a bank. That's how it was done. There was no federal body. So what happened was all the state, the, these state banks were printing their own money because we didn't have any gold money in the United States. We didn't have any gold. So they would print their own money, but nobody knew how much money Massachusetts was printing with you in Virginia and all that. So they wanted to put a stop to that. So that's why this is in the Constitution. They're prohibiting the states from doing anything. They're just prohibiting them from making money. And so they say, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold or silver a, pay, a tender in payment of debts. However, there's not been ever a single state who has made its payments in gold or silver coin. So that's obviously not what it meant. And that's what the Supreme Court has ruled. And it's just, he's got no excuse for saying this stuff. And unless you understand the U.S. Constitution, it just, you go, Ron Paul must know. Okay, another interesting item is this impressive petition that's currently circulating calling for the Congress to reissue uh, debt-free U.S. notes. I do have one problem with the wording, the, the uh, favorable mention of uh, the Kucinich-Conyers bill, which is the NEED Act. And so that's what this is. I'm going to tell you just very briefly a little bit about it. How many have heard of this, of the Kucinich bill to correct the evils of the Federal Reserve? Well, you know what? I'm going to skip it then. That's, a, a, no, that's too, too deep a dive in U.S. stuff. Okay. All right, let's move up to this then. Tungsten and gold bars. How, how many people have heard of this? Pretty many. Sorry, this computer is slow, and even in the mouse. Here's a picture of a perfectly good one kilogram Swiss gold bar. And then here's the top half of the gold bar. Notice on the bottom the bluish tungsten rods. You can start to see them. And then here's a side view, clearly showing that 40% of the weight is taken up by tungsten rods. The gold bar is bored, and then the tungsten rods are pressed into the end. Then more gold is poured over the end, uh, and the bar is reshaped, so nobody can tell the difference. Tungsten is the ideal substitution for gold because their densities is remarkable similar, remarkably similar. Gold has a specific gravity of 19.32 and tungsten has a specific gravity of 19.25. Tungsten is much less expensive, however, about $10 a pound. The problem is that who in their right ma mind would want to cut into their one kilo gold bar to discover that it's actually a fake and therefore worth 40% less? The implications of this are huge in the gold community and have rocked it to its foundations. This is great to be a monetary reformer with a story like this. It messes up the gold bug's uh, narrative that... Uh, Gold is solid and gold can't be counterfeited. How many people have heard, oh yeah, the NDAA, and probably everybody has heard of this bill in America, N not NDAA? 
National Defense Authorization Act. It's a, it has a whole group of totalitarian laws, and uh, Brigitte was uh, complaining about it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in April, the Drudge Report put up a story that said that uh, Iceland is making plans to forgive mortgage debt. This is just an example of how I've got to investigate all this stuff that people send me. So how many people had heard this, that Iceland was going to forgive mortgage debt? Okay, well, it, it's not true. Um, <clears throat> so I checked with uh, Brigitte, and uh, this is a cute little clip of her from The Secret of Why Oz. Why are governments pumping money into private banks? Why are they not letting them roll? I mean, just like any other. And then the excuse is, oh, they're too big to fail. <laughs> Let them fail. Please. I got so much fan mail on that saying, who is that girl? I'm in love with her. <laughs> so anyway. So here's her email back. And uh, this, the reason I, I put this at the front of the NDAA thing is because she mentions it. Um, Dear Bill, I'm sorry to say that this must be some sort of a joke. I'm gathering the facts versus fiction in order to respond to my blog. How are you, my friend? I'm on the way to Canada today. I'm still not able to travel to your country. So what the heck is that all about? It turns out Brigitte is suing the U U.S. government. Not the Icelandic parliament is suing the U.S. government. Brigitte is suing the U.S. government to prevent the implementation of the draconian provisions of the NDAA. Uh, and so this was her letter uh, to me. I felt under direct threat when NDAA was passed. I've not been able to travel to the U.S. for more than a year under advice from the Icelandic State Department. Basically what NDAA means is that the U.S. military can put anyone anywhere under the suspicion of being a terror threat or an associate and detain you forever without you having access to a lawyer or court. So I just want to say uh, a big thank you to Brigitte for going ahead. And... But in case you think that America is uh, now officially declared a totalitarian zone under Chairman Obama, uh, not so fast, Mr. Obama. We still have politicians uh, in our country who will stand up and fight as well. So I'm happy to report that a friend of mine in the House of Delegates of the state of Virginia, which is where I live, has gotten legislation passed which effectively guts enforcement of this act on Americans. And what it basically does is make it illegal for any state official to enforce this federal NDAA law. And this is a bold move for a state, but other states are doing it as well. So that, that law is effectively toast. You know, please, please don't believe when you hear that the U.S. is a fascist state. It's just not true. We're still a nation of free people. The powers of totalitarianism have been trying to re-enslave us now for 236 years, but they've been unable to do so. In our country, we have tens of millions of Americans who will fight to preserve their freedom. And let me tell you, you may not see it in your media coverage over here in Europe, but the American people move slowly and very surely, and we are nearing our boiling point. Trust me, this stuff will not stand. You know, and just one other thing, don't think for a moment that the American military is going to turn against the American people. It's not going to happen. O Obama might think it's going to happen, but he's wrong. These, these rulers who try to get too much power for themselves, they, they get surrounded by all their yes men and they think they can do everything. And the American people just kind of lag and they're still watching TV and they're watching football and they're not paying attention. But eventually they wake up. And uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a previous example of a guy who thought he could do what Obama's doing right now. So Richard Nixon thought he could make this happen. 
But he was wrong, and ultimately what brought Nixon down from completely shredding the U.S. Constitution was a group of military men who stood firm on their pledge to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. Now, now we're moving into something that I've never said before in a public forum. Excuse me? Yes. We'll see. I'm hopeful. Okay, now uh, we're going off the track here. Um, like I say, I've never told this story before, but I'll tell you the story of how I, I first became a writer. Uh, it was something that happened to me when I was 25 years old, and uh, it uh, changed the course of my life overnight. In the late 1980s, I wrote uh, um, my first book entitled New World Order, The Ancient Plan of Secret Societies. How many people have ever seen the cover of this book? I think it was translated into Polish at one point, but... Anyway, um, by, uh, it was uh, the first New World Order book. It was uh, uh, published in 1990. It sold over 250,000 copies, mostly in the U.S. It's out of print now, but uh, I'll get around to reprinting it here shortly. This is the, a page from the first chapter of the book. In October 1973, President Nixon had been ordered by the Supreme Court to turn over White House tape recordings that could potentially prove that he and his advisors were planning a military coup to keep himself in power. Has, has anybody ever heard of this? Probably not. Well, it was true. Huge demonstrations broke out in Washington. Um, I was part of them. Unless you were in Washington, you had no idea how huge these demonstrations were. This is an actual picture from the South Lawn looking north at the White House. The size was completely unreported by the press of the day. I was there. We surrounded the White House and banged pots and pans all day, all night. We later found out that the noise was so constant and deafening that the Nixon family talked about abandoning the White House just to get some rest. Well, seeing the atmosphere in Washington, one day we were watching the water... My dad and I were watching the Watergate hearings on TV. It was when I joined the White House staff in July of 1970 that I became fully aware of the extent of concern at the White House regarding demonstrations and intelligence information relating to demonstrators. It was approximately one month after I arrived at the White House that I was informed about a project that had been going on before I arrived to restructure the government's intelligence gathering capacities vis-a-vis -vis demonstrators and domestic radicals. The revised domestic intelligence plan was submitted in a document form to the president for his approval. The president of the committee has in its possession a copy of that document and certain related memoranda pursuant to the order of Judge Sirica. After I was told of the presidentially approved plan, they called for bugging burglarizing, mail cover. It was, a, it was a pretty nasty situation. So, my father uh, suddenly decided that he'd uh, better confide in me. He was initially, this is my dad, he was an Air Force officer, he was basically an Air Force scientist. Uh, he was initially a supporter of Richard Nixon, but as things progressed, he suddenly turned out, or he suddenly turned because of a very unusual contact. Um, I have to tell you a little something about my dad, or you're just not going to believe this. You think I made it up. But in 1973, my dad uh, was a, a retired Air Force officer, a scientist type. Uh, this is him uh, being awarded the Bronze Star for his uh, service. He volunteered to go on some of the most dangerous bombing missions uh, when he was stationed in England. He was the head of the radio shop for all the bombers. He was uh, the geek type. Uh, oh, let me, oops, forgot that. Yeah, here's the radio shop. That's, that's him uh, sitting on the left. He's the only officer in the picture. And uh, we, we didn't live a, a big life or anything like this. This is where we lived. This is, uh, in 1954, an old converted wooden barracks. The, the, this end of the building was exactly where we lived when my dad was getting his master's degree at the Air Force Institute of Technology. And this is my family. Um, that's my dad on the right. And uh, I'm the one holding my hand over my mouth. 
which I, I still do today, to kind of hide a speech impediment that I picked up from my father. I, I used to stutter really badly, which is why I have to read these things. Uh, my dad ended up being chief scientist of the Minuteman missile system. As he put it, he controlled everything with electrons flowing through it. Here is a Minuteman launch from the Air Force Western Launch Facility in California. Uh, naturally, nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles required very sophisticated and very secure command and control systems. Dad was in charge of all this, including the high-level connections of the entire defense communications network in the White House. Dad was a very modest man. He had a speech impediment that made him stutter all his life, so he wasn't a big talker. He was uh, always a big reader. Though he never claimed authorship, he did play a role in the formation of, uh, of the concept of the Internet for military purposes. In the late 1950s, he flew to Washington and uh, proposed the need for a survivable communications network for Minuteman, which involved distributed communications nodes so that there would be no single point of failure. The idea was to be able to communicate even after a first strike attack by the Soviet Union. A few years later, the Defense Department began funding a RAPNET through DARPA. This was the original Internet. My point here is not to brag. My point is that my dad knew how the Defense Communications Network was organized from a, a technical perspective. He specifically knew how to activate what was then called the big switch. I'm not sure where the big switch is now, but in those days, it was about 60 miles west of Washington, buried deep inside an old Civil War copper mine in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I know this seems to be going off the track, isn't it? But it, it'll get back. Um, <clears throat> what was the big switch? It was a place uh, from which all the major radio and television networks could be interrupted by the President or the Joint Chiefs of Staff in case of a national, national emergency. Uh, that can probably be done today with a flick of a switch uh, anywhere in, or in, in the White House or the Joint Chiefs Situation Room, but it was a difficult technical feat in those days. On October 3rd, 1973, my dad was approached by someone claiming to be affiliated with the Nixon White House and asked how he and his uh, friends in the military uh, would be, if they'd be willing to participate in an effort to create such chaotic conditions in the country that Nixon would have to declare martial law and then bypass the next election and declare himself president for a third term. In other words, in essence, a military coup. Uh, I'll read you just uh, the last two sentences of this. Maybe up here, yeah. We then entered into a discussion on tactics which could be used to execute such a coup. During the course of this discussion, I was questioned as to the feasibility of the plan and asked whether I thought senior military men could be enlisted in such an effort. So my dad uh, immediately saw what was going on and just played dumb and played along with it to get as much information as he could. Then this memorandum, he circulated to military intelligence and the FBI, and uh, eventually it was turned around. Um, we then entered into a discussion, oh yeah, I just read that, sorry. Anyway, needless to say, for the next 10 months I was uh, transported into a, a different world because I helped try, try to get the word out. That's my first uh, work in reported them, actually. Eventually, Nixon gave up and resigned. Now, all of his henchmen were tried and convicted, and the nation was saved uh, for democracy once again. However, few people realize how close this contest was, how close we came to losing our freedom. And speaking about freedom, a million Americans have given their lives since the founding of this nation, not to secure profits for corporations, although there's no denying that corporate profits may be one of the results of these wars, but there are lots of factors here. But that has zero effect in the minds of the average freedom-loving American soldier. We are a nation, and perhaps the only nation in history, who sends her young men and women into harm's way not to pursue corporate ideals, uh, although that sometimes happens, but to pursue a concept to preserve this precious concept of freedom. Yeah, we make mistakes doing it, but that's why we do it. It's not like the entire military is some corporate subdivision under Halliburton. 
I grew up in this stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm admitting it to you. So after uh, Nixon resigned and these uh, rascals were all tried and convicted, I knew from personal experience that there was a lot going on under the surface of Watergate, uh, the Watergate-Nixon affair, but I just couldn't get any of the press interested in the story. They'd figured out that the, what the crime was and they'd caught the bad guys and they didn't want to hear that there was something far bigger afoot. So I knew that someday I'd have to write my story, but I wasn't a writer. So I decided that uh, I needed to get some practice. So I started a newspaper in my county in Virginia and ran that for many years. It was during those years, 1980 specifically, uh, that I got uh, into the money question, which uh, I'll talk about later. Uh, but it started when an older gentleman called me up and said, boy, have I got a story for you. There's no gold left in Fort Knox. And as when you run a newspaper, you get the crazy people calling you all the time, trying to involve you, you know, in whatever their favorite story is. And I developed this way of uh, efficiently getting rid of them. I said, that's great. Send me something in the mail and hung up the phone. You know, I was off the phone in 30 seconds. Well, this guy with the Fort Knox story, he wasn't, ended up, he wasn't crazy. Two days later, I got this thick packet of papers. He was a retired Ohio uh, industrial, or uh, farm implement manufacturer, and he'd moved to Washington just to be close to Washington to pursue his hobby, which was, excuse me, try to get the federal government to uh, produce an audit of the gold reserves in Fort Knox. Uh, at the end of World War II, the largest collection of gold ever assembled in the history of the world was in Fort Knox, about 72% of world gold. All, all nations put all the gold there because they thought Hitler, you know, might get it, whatever. So anyway, anyway, that's, that's how I, I got into this whole story with the Fort Knox Gold story. As a reporter, I knew something was going on, but it took me another 12 years to figure out uh, what it was, and that uh, led to uh, my first book on the subject in 1992 called On the Horns of the Beast, the Federal Reserve, and the New World Order. And that uh, didn't sell very well, but one lawyer, a wealthy attorney in Oklahoma, saw it and said, this is great. We need to do something else. And I, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do a video so that we can spread this wider. And he said, great, I've got the money. Let's go. And so I wrote the Money Master's script in six weeks. And for the next six, six weeks later, I was here in Europe fi filming it. And um, by the early part of uh, 1996, we put it out. It was put out under incredible time pressure. How we put it together a three-hour and 23-minute documentary video in that amount of time, I have no idea. But in any case, it's been pretty successful. Well, um, so back to the book. I, I wrote the book and got a publisher, but um, uh, guess what? Then I had to start doing radio and TV interviews. But I couldn't talk, so that was kind of a problem for an author. Uh, I was painfully shy because I'd stuttered all my life. I mean, you see me here, I'm not, I'm not, I'm reading this, you guys know that. In all my videos, I'm, I'm not just, I don't have a brilliant memory, I read it all. I've got I developed this system where I've got the video camera here, and I've got, I've got a script right here besides the lens, and I'm reading it. And I've got these glasses tuned in so I can read 36-point uh, type at 15 feet. So you can't see my eyes moving. <laughs> it's the best I could do. <laughs> this, this might not be going well. Anyway, now, <laughs> now it's, I've done over 3,000 radio and TV interviews. I don't stutter anymore, but I'm still a horrible speaker. And that's the way I have to do this. And so... I just do the best I can. And, you know, without this PowerPoint to where I could read it, I'd have to be reading it off a piece of paper. I mean, you know, that wouldn't do too well. All right, so now let's go to the final thing here, money reform, monetary reform. Again, the two great pillars of monetary reform. Uh, this year, the United States will pay over $500 billion a year just paying the interest on the national debt. I think the UN uh, came out with a report say saying that uh, uh, most of the deaths in Africa due to malnutrition or hunger could be fixed for $187 billion per year. 
I think it's like 5 million people could be saved for $187 billion a year, and we're paying $500 billion a year just in interest on the national debt, a, a payment that is entirely unnecessary because most of it is going to banks. We don't have to do it this way. We don't have to have a national debt. We can just create our money. We just control the quantity. That's it. In, just in a simple nutshell, that's all you have to do. I could come, come up and deliver some impressive, detailed plan, but it's not difficult. It just wouldn't be honest. Okay, so... How much is $500 billion? Well, the United States spends $19 billion for all of NASA, $7 billion for the National Science Foundation. The entire CIA is run on $20 billion. Of course, they have a black budget, but <laughs> $23 billion for the justice, uh, $43 billion for Homeland Security, boy, ooh. and uh, $47 billion for the Department of Education. All these agencies together are only $160 billion. Well, what is, did, did somebody tell me what the national budget of uh, Denmark is per year. Does anybody know? Krona, 700 million krona. 700 billion, it must be billion krona. Well, anyway, you get the point that, you know, we're spending a lot of money on interest that we don't have to that could save a lot of people's lives. That's my only point. This $500 billion, in fact, is, is equivalent to the entire discretionary budget of Congress. In other words, all the stuff that congressmen fight about you know, we have like fixed costs for Medicare, Social Security, stuff like that. Not counting that stuff that we have to pay no matter what. All the stuff about how many bridges to build, how many roads to fund, libraries, etc. All that only amounts to $500 billion. An amount that is the equivalent of what we pay mostly to banks just in interest on the national debt. It's outrageous. And I guarantee it's the same thing in your country. So, this is, I meant that to be a surprise, doggone it, I'm so shaken up here. Anyway, the Congressional Budget Office uh, says that by the year 2020, which is only uh, seven and a half years from now, this is how much the United States government will be paying in interest on the national debt, one trillion dollars. It's rising astronomically now. So, how much is a billion? Never mind a trillion. A billion seconds ago, it was 1959. A billion minutes ago, Jesus was alive. A billion hours ago, our ancestors were living in the Stone Age. And a billion dollars ago was only eight hours and 20 minutes at the rate Washington spends money. That's why the general public, from the Occupy folks to the conservative Republicans and everyone in between, realize that government is out of control. It's no longer responsive to the people. And that's just what you guys think in your country, and it's what everybody thinks in every country I go to, I guarantee you. So what's the cause of that? Why is government not responsive to the people? Because it's responsive to what? Banks. The national debt is a loss of democratic control of government by we the people. Yesterday we heard several presenters call this autocracy, but I've got a better word for it, something that's much more specific. It really should be called plutocracy, rule by the rich. This is what the entire last thousand years of humankind's march out of freedom has been all about. How to create political systems that will allow the majority to escape serfdom, to escape the plutocracy. That's what government is all about. That's why government was formed. Without government, there is no way that we won't devolve back into it. And right now, we don't have effective government because it's not responsive to we the people. We're not running the show anymore. So thereby, we have to devolve back into serfdom unless we change the system. And there's only one way to do it, and that's what Brigitte's doing. Gee, I just said that, didn't I? Got carried away and didn't read something. My goodness. So, um, 
<clears throat> How do we make, make government respond to the will of the people? One way is through promotion of alternative voting methods. This is something very interesting because right now, um, the, in America, the two-party system is absolutely dominant, and you just you can't break it. I mean, even the Libertarian Party, with as many people as they have working on the system, can't get their doofus candidate on the ballot in all 50 states because the Republicans and Democrats both attack them with legal challenges to their ability to have ballot access, and it just drains their coffers. So you got to figure out a way to break the, the duopoly, the, the two-party system, and this is really great. I, uh, there are a variety of different voting methods, plurality voting, approval voting, uh, range vo voting, uh, instant runoff voting, and there has just been a study released by the, the Occupy Wall Street people from New York uh, showing uh, that uh, these following vo the, these voting methods, alternative voting methods, work really well and do not favor the two-party system. They favor the smaller candidates. So this is one option that you can try to do. Only four more slides, only four more slides. Think of it, and then I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, the, older the, get, the, the older I get, the more I like complementary currencies. Complementary currencies tend to keep the main currency honest. They create economic stability, and economic stability is the absolute key for what we have to be going for, not economic volatility. Uh, silver was a complementary currency in 1896. Tally sticks was a good example of a complementary currency. Uh, the entire development of, uh, of Britain, of England through the Middle Ages. Uh, the Guernsey pounds still circulate. In Guernsey, there are two type of pound notes. There's the Guernsey pound and there's the British pound. And they circulate, they, they trade one for one, which is called at par. And uh, any time Guer Guernsey needs to build a new, let's say, a road or something like that, they don't have to go to taxation to do it. They can just issue the money. They issue the money, they let the contract to build the roads, and then uh, if, if that has caused inflation, which issuing additional money always does tend to cause inflation, if you go on the Guernsey website, they've got all kinds of stuff, graphs and charts watching for inflation. That's what they're all about. And as soon as they see that inflation, what do they do? They remove money from the system by taxation. They take it back out. That's the ideal use of a, ma of a national money. You create more when you need it. If, in, if when it uh, starts hitting inflation, you take it back out by taxation. And that way you create stability. And you get all the, the infrastructure stuff that you need. I know it sounds pie in the sky, but it's true. It works. Okay, alternative banking solutions. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'll be in Switzerland uh, in two days. Uh, I'm going to investigate Werbank. Then there's Yacht Bank in Sweden. Uh, there are some guys right, right here who have alternative banking systems going right here in Denmark. And they're, try you know, Denmark, good Lord, did you know that it, I didn't realize it, it's illegal to have complementary currencies in Denmark? Did you all know that? That's unbelievable. Another good alternative is the Bank of North Dakota model that uh, Ellen Brown, uh, the author of Web of Debt, is pushing very hard. She, Ellen's an old friend of mine. We talk all the time. Um, and there, there's many, many uh, other alternatives that you can do. Okay, this is, I've saved the best quote for last. This is my favorite quote, an obscure little quote that no American has really seen until I put it in front of them. Um, it's Governor Morris. He was uh, one of the main authors of the Constitution, and it embodies what I believe we should be doing with good governance. The rich will stri strive to establish their dominion and enslave the rest. They always did. They always will. They will have the same effect here as elsewhere if we do not, by the power of government, keep them in their proper spheres. We're not talking about stealing their money. We're not talking about throwing them in jail. We just want to keep them in their proper spheres. Just like Irving Fisher said, the great uh, economist of, of the Great Depression era, he was uh, head of uh, economics for Yale University. He said, we do not need to nationalize banking. We need to nationalize money. 
We need a thriving, competitive banking industry. Because if these guys don't want to loan me money because they say, oh, that Bill Still, he's a nut, he's a wacko, we're not going to give him a mortgage, then I'd be out of luck if they were the only bank in town. But I go to this guy's bank, and he said, yeah, you're a pretty good guy. I'll give you the money. We need that competition. Monetary reform is the only solution to the greatest problems of this world, the new human rights movement of the next generation, because it can eliminate most of the world's hunger, poverty, misery, and disease. Thank you very much for inviting me and coming to, to see me speak. And again, I apologize for reading to you and for being late. And I, I, uh, if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them if we still have some time. way in the back. Um, I have a question too. Okay, well you've got the mic, so <laughs> plus you, you made my computer work. <laughs> um, Bill, uh, before we hopefully end up with a good system, a fair system, a system controlled by the people, I think we should also plan that it will not go so fast. Uh, do you agree that people should invest in physical gold? And oh, yeah, absolutely, especially with all this, this new uh, thrust of QE, the, the commodities, especially the, the metals markets, are going to go through the roof. So and I would have said that before this new round of QE, but now... So, so if the people, you, need to keep the... What should we say? All the money you have the, earned, all right. uh, you can say it better. Right, right. If you want to maintain the value of your money, sure, investing in gold and silver coin, especially silver. Silver is way undervalued right now. There's a, been a historic ratio between gold and silver, and for some reason, silver has lagged way behind. So I think you're, you're best. And I'm not an investment advisor, but I, I would, I've got my money in silver. I'll put it that way. I can uh, tell you we will... Um on the Open Mind Conference homepage, uh, give you some advice how to do that. I don't speak this language. <laughs> okay, I think I need to continue to hold this. Yeah. Um, if you want to invest in silver, you need to buy it in Germany. Because if you buy silver in Denmark, you, trade, you pay 25% in tax. Yeah, if you buy junk silver, but if you buy coins or bar, sorry, if you buy coins, you have only pay uh, VAT, that's mumps. You only pay 7% in Germany, but here in Denmark you pay 25%. But we will put in some info for you how to do it, and if you follow that, yeah, we also have connections uh, to avoid that. And this is not because that we will be involved in earning any money on this kind of info. The only thing we would like to do is for you to secure the future of you and your family. I think we have a, a man here with some banking background or know-how who would like to say something. Uh, my name is Jakob Mikkelsen. I'm from the Danish JAK, and um, I would like to thank Bill for a fine speech, and uh, thank you for your little talk to you as well. Um, I would like to um, uh, to invite you to visit our uh, homepage on the internet, 
jak.dk. Then you can have uh, links, you can find links uh, to our magazine, JAK magazine, uh, where we have several uh, articles and pieces about the work we have been doing for two and a half years within this uh, subject about uh, creating money, money and uh, the problems with the interest. We work with interest-free economy. So I think, uh, thank you for... Yeah, I had a nice talk with them this afternoon. They're, they're doing some good work in, in a, uh, uh, alternative banking arena. And by the way, just to tell you, I, I can't believe I didn't even tell you this. What I'm doing here after I leave is I'm starting a new film. It's called Jekyll Island. It's about the 1910 meeting that occurred in Jekyll Island between the three major banking families, the Rockefellers, uh, the Rothschilds, and J.P. Morgan, where they decided how the Federal Reserve would be constructed and hopefully it'll be out by the end of the year. I'd like to ask you, uh, who are the main shareholders of Federal Reserve? And are these shareholders of Federal Reserve, are they the same who owns uh, Federal of New York and the other federal uh, banks? You know, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but I don't care. But, uh, it, number one, if you were to jail every Rothschild and every Rockefeller uh, in the world tomorrow, nothing would change. The people don't matter. It's what they're doing. The way you can change this is understand the very simple process that they're doing and the way they're hiding it from us and fix it that way. Uh, and uh, another thing, it, uh, the, the actual shareholders are, every federally chartered bank in the United States is re required to be a shareholder in the Federal Reserve. So there are tens of thousands of shareholders. So uh, it just, it makes no sense to even go down that trail. That was what Eustace Mullins kind of promulgated with his first book on the Federal Reserve. And, I, I just don't pay any attention to that. I'm sorry. Uh, it is important that um, that uh, currency, the 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 paper money, is backed up by something, gold, silver, or whatever. No, not it's important. Not no, in fact, you don't want it backed up by any type of a, of, of a commodity. Anything that can be traded on the electronic market should not serve as a backing for money. Why? What would happen, I'll just use the American example, as such a bill started to gradually march its way through Congress, what would happen to the gold futures market, especially when the rumor got out that, you know, that crazy guy says that there's no gold left in Fort Knox. What do you think would happen? You know, in, in other words, if it's traded on the markets electronically as, as a bill starts going through Congress, the rich guys in the world are going to buy up everything that they can get their hands on. You can't have money backed by anything for it to serve the public interest. In order for money to serve the public interest, it has to be valueless and ubiquitous. Ubiquitous means available everywhere. Thank you. Uh, another question is that uh, when do you think the collapse will come? I'd be a fool to say that. I, I've, I, everybody asks me that all the time and I give them the same answer. I've been giving them the same answer for 20 years. I don't know. Because every, every time that I think in my mind I've got it pinned down, I'm always wrong. They're always able to somehow reinflate the bubble, you know, by some new mechanism. It might go on, it, it might, might happen before the end of the year, it might happen. I've heard a lot of people that I respect say there are certain forces coming together in the spring of 2013 where there's a good chance that it'll happen then. I don't know. I would like you to, if you can tell us uh, if the Fed and the ECB are working very closely uh, tight and if you know anything what's happening in, uh, in Europe, you know ECB is trying, they want to make this uh, um, federation of states and they want to make this bank union. Oh, do you, yeah, do you, you have good any question. idea what's, because we live in well, Europe. I, you know? I'm, sure, I'm sure they work hand in hand but I, I, I don't have the evidence. I, I think what, what's going on right now with all this quantitative easing worldwide is they've decided if, well, if just the United States pumped up its money supply, then it would be obvious that there was inflation. So let's have the ECB do it, then the U.S., and now Japan's going to do it, and they'll try to kind of raise all the boats at the same time to try to hide the fact of, of what's going on. And as far as your question about uh, consolidation of power, that's really one of my 
the biggest things I get upset about. We need to deconsolidate power at every level of governance in every country. That, that's the, the term I use is deconsolidation of power. Power is way too consolidated right now. The whole Euro thing, e ECB thing, all that, way too consolidated. Every nation, you, everybody needs to get out of the Euro. Destroy the Euro. Throw it away. Nations need to issue their own debt-free government-issued money for the benefit of their own citizens only. Consolidating it is just giving it over to the bankers. Right. Don't import your goods from boats. Uh, do you agree that money should uh, reflect value produced by the people so that it should balance the, the... Do you understand what I mean? You put out s products, services, and the money, the amount of money in the society should reflect the value of that I of understand your question, and I'm not sure how to answer. I'll, I'll put it that way. You know, when, when I first... Uh, produce the money masters. I wanted it to, this is a little story I forgot to tell you. I, I wanted it to, to be looked at by a, a professional economist because I'm, I have no training in economics. None. I just make that up as I go along. And so I wanted to be sure that I hadn't done something, you know, that I could immediately be discredited. So I'd been a reporter all my life. I knew how to talk to professors, how to get professors on the telephone. You don't call the professor, you call the university press office. You say, I got this story, I need to talk to a professor. And then they go and they get the professor. You know, then it's under the university auspices, and so you get through to them right away. So I, I wanted to shoot for the moon, so when I first uh, had the first uh, edited cut of the Money Masters, I uh, called Stanford University. I wanted to talk to Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winning economist. Figured it wouldn't happen, but... Next day, Milton Friedman's on the phone. <laughs> he said, yeah, okay, well, send it to me. Overnight it to me. I'll look at it over the weekend. I went, well, this is great. <laughs> so anyway, Monday morning, ring, ring. It's Milton Friedman on the phone. And I'll never forget what he said to me. The first sentence out of his mouth was well, he said, boy, if you kill the Fed and don't do anything about fractional reserve lending, you've done nothing. And that just blew me away, because I really didn't understand it to that depth. It's not the Fed. If you kill the Fed, you do nothing. It's the banks and their fractional reserve lending behind the Fed. The Fed is called federal, but it's not federal. Everybody in the United States now knows that. Well, not everybody, but everybody I know. It, it's just a fake out to make you think that it's part of the government, so to make you think that the government is controlling the banks when we all know the Fed is con completely owned. Every share of stock in it is completely owned by the banks. It's just a fake out. There's nothing federal about it. You have to go after the bank's ability to counterfeit the national money and the control that gives them over your political system. Uh, I have also a question more. Um, I think in your book, No More National Debt, uh, you also write how, uh, about how we will avoid this big crash by making all these loans into the reserves of the bank in the future. Is that correct? Hmm. I don't, don't remember. I don't understand the question. How nice, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of times I'll write stuff in a book and then forget what I wrote. So. But we have a lot of debt now. Yeah. Can this debt just go away? Oh, I understand your question. Yeah, well, for example, <laughs> for example, the way the Fed creates money in the system is that the, the Treasury prints a bond. It prints, a, a, let's say, a million-dollar bond and then gives it to the Fed. The Fed sells it into the open market. Half the time it gets sold to another bank or a central bank. So those bonds are all out there floating around, like uh, whatever the national debt is, $16 trillion worth right now. But there's an easy solution to fix this, and that's 
Do I, did I bring them? Oh, I brought them. <laughs> See, this is, a, this is a Federal Reserve note. This is our money in America. It has a little green seal right here. That means it's a Federal Reserve note. It's a debt instrument. It was created through the sale of these bonds. But this, this looks just the same, except for one thing. It doesn't have a green seal. It has a red seal. These are Lincoln's old greenbacks, just reprinted 11 different times throughout American history. They never were able to kill them. They're debt-free money. We could just print these just by changing the color of the seal and pay off these bonds as they came due, and that's it. We'd be out of debt forever. And then, proportionally, you'd have to lower the reserve requirements so banks could only lend money they actually have, and that would you'd adjust inflation by that mechanism, gradually lowering reserve requirements as these came into the money stream, and that's it. It's over. I, I don't know exactly how to, how to translate that into the Danish situation, but it's just so simple to fix in America. And, and this will be the same for, for Europe, because there you have more... Di when the euro die, and it will die, then you have a lot of different kind of currencies how, how could that be fixed? Because they have a lot of debt in Euro now, but if it dies, is that debt gone? You know, I can barely figure out the U.S. system. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it to guys like this, like I told you today, to figure out the Danish system. It's, I would just be so presumptuous to try to think that I knew enough to be able to give an opinion on how to specifically fix each individual nation. If you know the basic principles I've laid out, though, you can figure it out for yourselves. You need to deconsolidate power, especially the money power. Um, uh, you know, in Europe, more and more, uh, they, are, um, talk, they want to have... Uh, we have to pay with they think it's a good idea with electronic money, with mobile. They are saying, so we won't have any paper soon. Everybody is in the young people and think it's a very good idea. You can come up in the bus and you pay with the mobile. In Sweden now, they want to change as soon as possible that everything will be electronic, you know. So how this is going to be able, we, we will not be able to print money. It's all going to be on computers. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's all bad, I think. I, but I'd want to I'd hear a debate back and forth on this. That's something I haven't really thought through. But off the top of my head, I don't think that's necessarily bad if the money in the first instance is not borrowed from a bank but created by the national government without debt, even if it's electronic, I think it would be all right. Would you guys, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, they'd agree with that. Okay. Excuse me? I can't do anything about the chip, but I can fix money, and that's big enough for one lifetime. Um... I think they're done. Should we um, continue with questions? Uh, because then we have a very long evening. I, uh, Bill will be here. So if one of you will, really is burning, you have a chance to ask Bill during the evening. Uh, so I think we should stop for now and give Bill a warm applause. Thank you.